Uh, we have three very important contributions. Uh, these are people I've always looked up to and I've always uh, consulted on very important issues in the Arab American community. Abdin Jbara, the civil rights lawyer. Uh, Ismail Ahmed, the dir executive director of Access and Janice Terry, professor of Middle East studies. And I'm, uh, you have their biographies and I'm not gonna take any more of their time. So Abdin. By way of truth in advertising, uh, this morning I met uh, Ish in the computer room of the hotel and uh, I asked him, do you have a copy of your paper you could give me? And he got it out and handed it to me and he kind of sheepishly said, well, I'm not an academic. <laughs> so I said, well, that's good because I'm not either. <laughs> uh, what I have to say today is basically something that's based upon my experience. Uh, for those of you who do not know me, I was born and raised in Michigan. I was born in a very small town in the northern part of the state. Uh, our town had a population of about a thousand and it was the largest town in the whole county, to give you some kind of an idea. And our family was only one of two Arab families in the town, That the other one being my uh, father's cousin, who was married to my mother's sister. <laughs> uh, having said that, um, and I went to the University of Michigan and I, they had a foreign language requirement that, uh, for undergraduates and I said, well, my goodness, I well, might as well take Arabic. I mean, uh, they offered it and I said, it's gonna come easier to me than it would to the normal person. How, how little did I know? <laughs> Uh, but once I got a taste of it, I traveled to the Middle East. I went to Egypt and then um, Lebanon and what have you and came back, finished my education uh, in law school, studied Arabic again, went back to Lebanon to study some more Arabic and then opened my law practice in Detroit, Michigan and the rest, as they say, is history. Now, when I was, I, I really want to commend the Wilson Center for organizing this event, and n number one, and number two, for asking me to participate because they didn't know what I was going to say. <laughs> and what I'm going to say is, is um, somehow ties into what has been said before, uh, but it's a rather uh, pessimistic uh, analysis particularly on the subject of uh, Arab Americans running for Congress or being elected to Congress. And um, it's a pessimistic subject because um, of the way America is organized um, and the way American politics are organized. It's not something that's wrong with Arab Americans. Um, but it's a way, uh, it's a system, if you will. So I'm going to read and then extrapolate uh, from time to time, and hopefully uh, I will not get the buzzer before I'm done. <laughs> now, in considering the viability of a, an electoral strategy for Arab Americans or non-Arab Muslim Americans, one must analyze the nature of American political system and the role of ethnic, religious, class, and other interests play in it. While the United States can be defined as a political system that is democratic, for the most of its history it has contained all of its myriad social divisions within two major parties. Third parties have arisen from time to time, but their ideas have been either co-opted through adoption of their main platform points or they have been forced to remain on the margins of American political life because of lack of access to funds uh, to mount a credible electoral effort. <clears throat> the Green Party, Labor Party, one can, uh, Ross Perot's party, one can talk about all the different parties that uh, reflect this. 
Now, an understanding of power and politics is essential to answering the question of whether American Arabs or Muslim Americans can mount successful bids for representation on the national electoral scene. And to understand power and politics, one must understand the way American political system enables special interest groups to influence and control certain aspects of policy. <clears throat> The two above considerations can only be understood within the larger construct of the United States as a capitalist society. I know a lot of people don't like to use that word because it sounds uh, subversive. That seeks to provide maximum advantageous access to foreign capital, labor, pools, markets, and resources. Another part of this construct is a huge military and security establishment <coughs> that the United States government has erected under the aegis of both major parties in pursuit of what the parties would call American leadership and others might call American dominance and control. There are several different analyses that describe the American political system. A Marxist analysis would describe it as a system driven by capital accumulation and divided by economic and racial classes within the society. Under this analysis, this country's democracy is wedded to what American politicians label, label f quote, free market forces. And those who are elected to public office, particularly at the national level, are in effect elected to support and uphold that economic system. Thus, no politician could openly call for public ownership of any of the means of production, and even supporting such programs as universal health care is seen by many as socialistic. Now, uh, people elected to Congress from time to time are called upon to support U.S. foreign military and political interventions that permit continuing U.S. control of resources in the Middle East and elsewhere, as was the case in Iraq. Another analysis, however, points to the fact that the rise of corporate capitalism did not assure political power for a political elite. And throughout American history, there have been mass reform movements that have sought to correct the excesses of corporate capitalism. These reform movements are reflected in legislation that seek to regulate corporate greed. Under this analysis, Americans may be divided by economic status and race and ethnicity, but there is a political elite consensus that the free market system provides the greatest good for the greatest number of American citizens. This is essentially the modern pluralist theory in which two segments of a democratic elite that are in agreement on bedrock economic foundations of the country compete with one another for turns at political power, with the differences among this elite being about how best to advance American power in the world. The doctrine that money is equivalent to speech, which is really one of the bedrock positions that uh, I'm going to talk about here in terms of Arab Americans running for office, a position that had been adopted by both the U.S. Supreme Court and the American Civil Liberties Union is completely consonant with either analysis of the American political system. To discuss the role of money in politics and the laws governing campaign financing, one must look to the Supreme Court ruling in the landmark decision of Buckley versus Vallejo. There, the court ruled that free speech provision of the Constitution's First Amendment protects an individual's ability to spend as much of his or her own money as he or she wishes in pursuit of political office. Buckley held that contributions to candidates for congressional office could be restricted, upholding the Campaign Financing Reform Act of 1974. <clears throat> the act provides for limits on individual campaign contributions for the public disclosure disclosure of uh, contributions, and for the establishment of political action committees, each of which is limited in the amount that they can give to a campaign. The act does not, however, limit the amount a wealthy individual can spend on uh, his or her own campaign or on uncoordinated negative advertising against a targeted candidate. After each scandal, public unrest forces Congress to pass pass yet new campaign reform measures, most recently <clears throat> being legislation uh, directed at lobbyists, which uh, restricts which gifts members of Congress can accept from lobbyists. 
Notably exempted from this are paid trips by constituents to foreign country that the constituent wants the Congress to support. This exemption was a result of pro-Israeli lobbying to allow the continued sponsored trips of candidates and members of Congress to Israel. Running for election to Congress requires a great deal of money, which is why wealthy individuals have a substantial advantage over persons who are not wealthy. A person who is not wealthy must raise the money he or she needs to run from either individuals or political action committees. While both the Supreme Court and, in Buckley and the Congress in the subsequent Campaign Financing Reform Act emphasized eliminating the appearance of quid pro quos in campaign contributions, the fact of the matter is that candidates are supported because of positions they have or have not espoused. And candidates tailor their position to attract the donations that they need to get elected, and once elected, to stay in office. Since the passage of the Campaign Financing Act, several scandals, including the one involving the Savings and Loan Association, and more recently, Abramoff Indian Casino debacle, have underscored how much, even when things change, they remain the same. While Arab Americans are learning to donate politically, they do not have a well-established and well-oiled apparatus, such as a 30 to 40 odd pro-Israeli PACs that were set up immediately after the Campaign Financing Act was uh, established around the United States with these very innocuous names to make certain that Congress would maintain a pro-Israeli stance. Nor do Arab Americans have the level of wealth to match the pro-Israeli money that is available in American politics. The enforcement of what are sometimes arcane rules governing the campaign financing laws has been delegated to a bipartisan, presidentially appointed Federal Election Commission that, it can be argued, has generally gone to bat to protect pro-Israeli operations in the United States. And I, here in my paper I cite a petition that was filed by 10 former diplomats with the uh, Federal Election Commission, the case of which went all the way to the Supreme Court. Uh, who decided in the end to send it back to the Federal Election Commission, which was the source of the problem in the first place. Um, now, I'm not going to speak about the uh, prospects in the election of 2006, but I want to just talk about some of the enormous hurdles that anybody who wants to run for office has. Number one is this money issue. A number, another one is, is that once a person is an incumbent in office, they have an, an enormous advantage against any challenger. Uh, in the absence of scan, a real serious scandal, the incumbent can raise uh, much more money, generally, than a challenger. And uh, <clears throat> many of these districts in which the incumbents uh, represent uh, people are uh, gerrymandered. That is, their lines are drawn in such a way that they will draw in people from that particular uh, party to support that candidacy, either Republican or Democratic. So, uh, so there are uh, numerous hurdles to get to stage one. Now, now, there are a number of ways that a person can run for office. You can be a celebrity, like Sonny Bono, for instance. And, and because of your name, get uh, some uh, uh, notoriety and, 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 and uh, lots of press. You can be a very wealthy person, like uh, John Corzine of New Jersey. Uh, he could, on the basis of his own money, uh, run for office. And as you know, he's now the uh, governor of New Jersey. Uh, he had been the senator. Or you can work your way up in local politics, uh, holding local office, uh, and use local office, either on the state or municipal level, as a springboard to national office. Uh, our senator, one of the senators from Michigan was on the Detroit City Council, and he's now a senator. And it was because of his presence on the Detroit City Council that he was able to do that. Now, there's a fourth way. Uh, and this way is, is how the uh, 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 
parties move people that they want. I mean, right now, for instance, there's a uh, person who lost her legs, a woman who lost her legs in Iraq, who is running in Illinois, but she's getting all of her support from the Democratic Party. The, the money, the financing, et cetera, for her campaign is coming from the Democratic Party. They're giving her the advice, et cetera, et cetera. So, so those are the basic four ways by, by which a person can w run for Congress. <coughs> now I want to talk about Arab Americans in the political arena. Um, now, Michael has talked about how there's a history of this political involvement, I'm, but I'm talking about running for public office and indeed for Congress. It's a fairly recent phenomenon, running for, uh, for, for uh, Congress. And in terms of the politicization of the Arab American community, in terms of the national political arena, I would, I still tend to date it from the mid-60s and the Arab-Israeli wars of 1967, the uh, Israeli invasion of Lebanon, which made Arab Americans flock to national organizations, and the ABSCAM uh, operation in which the Justice Department took a swarthy Italian, ethnically Italian person, dressed him up with a kafi and a gad to entrap certain uh, corrupt congressmen. And they saw the Justice Department and the government saw that as a great success because they were able to get some convictions. Whereas they were totally oblivious to and unapologetic to the Arab American community when this happened, and when uh, Jim Aberrisk went to the then uh, head of the Justice Department and complained, and the, uh, uh, or the FBI, uh, William Webster, he said, well, we needed somebody who would be credible, despite the fact that there, there historically there has been no F uh, examples of Arabs trying to uh, bribe uh, 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 public officials. Now, let's move on here to, uh, uh, the uh, Congress. Now, Arab Americans have served and are currently serving in Congress for Jim, uh, Jim Abdenur, Jim Abariz, Spencer Abraham, and George Mitchell have served in the Senate as of 2006. Ray LaHood, Nick Rahal, Daryl Issa, and Chris John, uh, excuse me, not Chris John, serve in the House of Representatives. He, he, Chris John is no longer in there. There are two others. Some of these members of Congress have been supportive of Arab American issues and concerns, and others have not. Some, as, such as Senator George Mitchell, have been close to and mindful of the power of the pro-Israeli lobby. None of them, however, save Mitchell and Lahoud, rose to prominence and influence in the chamber in which they served. And none, to the best knowledge of this author, <laughs> sought to use their elected positions to proactively promote among their colleagues, a counterweight to the dominance of the pro-Israeli discourse in Congress. It's not, so, so for me, it's, it's, it's not important whether there's an Arab American elected to Congress, all right? It depends on what kind of person. The Arab Americans have generally gotten much more support from uh, African American members of Congress and from some uh, progressive whites. Now this is completely understandable. Uh, with the exception of those in leadership positions in the two chambers, of those who have important committee memberships, an individual congressman generally has very little power or influence over any individual issue. The member's main concern is to maintain their standing with their constituent base and undertake fundraising for their periodic re-election re campaigns. Because of the high cost of election campaigns, much of a member of Congress's time is spent cultivating and developing new contributors. That's just the long and the short of it, and, and, and the average American is not aware of that. I heard Teddy Kennedy uh, touting his new book the other day on, on the radio, and they asked him, how has uh, the Senate changed? He says, well, I've been here for 43 years, he says. He said that the problem now, the real problem now is money. He said uh, the senators leave on Thursday night and they don't get back into the Senate to start their work until Tuesday afternoon. So they're talking about a two and a half day uh, work week. Uh, um, and, and Senator Harry Reid from, uh, um, who's the uh, minority whip, 
majority leader, has said we have one of the most corrupt Congresses in the history of the United States. Well, I have much more to say here, but I've been told that uh, I don't have time to say it. But, 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 given, but given the Dubai ports scandal and given what's happened in New Jersey when a, somebody who was going to be a freeholder, an Arab American who was a freeholder, had to resign because he had said that suicide bombings by Palestinians is different than the suicide bombings of 9-11. He had to resign. He was forced to resign. Uh, because of this and because of the, the enormity of the anti-Muslim and anti-Arab sediment that's abroad in this country, I think that it's going to take uh, not months but many, many years before we have come to a position where the uh, Americans generally see that uh, Arab Americans can play a positive and, and uh, role and contribute uh, to this society. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, I think what I'm going to have to say is a little bit more optimistic. Uh, but, but there really truly are barriers here, and we'll talk a little bit about them. Uh, I'm going to focus in on Michigan in the main, although in many ways I'll be talking regionally and nationally as well uh, because of the important role that Michigan plays. Uh, but first, uh, I'd like to uh, begin by uh, saying a few things ahead of time. One, uh, a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about really have not been researched, and so I've had to spend a lot of time talking to people who have been around longer than I have, and so, and also using my own experience. And so much of what I will say in terms of facts are the facts that they have given me or that I'm putting forward, and they may not be everybody else's facts. And so I think that's an important disclaimer. I also want to say that uh, I'm going to focus in a bit on the positive. Uh, but in the end, I think that uh, uh, if we're going to look at the electoral advancement in Michigan, uh, especially in places like Dearborn, Michigan, it's not what it should be. Uh, uh, so, uh, but I feel good about the prognosis for the future. And I think Abdin has made it clear, and I think abundantly clear, that electing Arab Americans is not the same as political influence, or that, or that our issues will necessarily be taken up. And that's the difference, because if you look at Congress, we're not that far away from a representation based on the population. Uh, and even in Michigan, that's the case. But the question is, are the political vehicles and institutions there uh, to make the difference in the long run? And I will be talking about that at the very end. So let me go quickly to say that uh, I'd like to thank M M Dr. Michael Suleiman for helping to set this up so that I can dispense with about a third of my speech. <laughs> Arab Americans generally have come to this country uh, over the last hundred years, actually they go back much farther than that, but uh, over the last hundred years in large numbers, uh, moving westward and southward. Uh, and as they were moved westward, uh, they ended up where there was work. They came across as, uh, as you know, as uh, miners and uh, uh, wage workers and most of all peddlers. And so where there was work and opportunity, they stopped. Michigan was a jumping off place uh, to Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and Sioux Falls, South Dakota, where you could homestead, and even Seattle, where there was a, a very active lumber industry. Uh, and it wasn't until the uh, Ford Motor Company opened up the first Model T plant uh, 
early uh, in the uh, uh, 1900s that uh, Arab Americans actually settled in the city of Highland Park, and there was actually substantial uh, community there. Uh, and uh, the reasons were obvious. Uh, Ford Motor Company was paying $5 a day, uh, an extravagant wage if, uh, uh, if you were looking for work at that time. Uh, and it wasn't long after that uh, that the Ford Motor Company then opened up uh, the Rouge Complex in what was to become Dearborn. It wasn't Dearborn yet. And uh, that Rouge Complex became uh, the largest industrial complex in the world. It had 90,000 workers at it uh, by the 1940s. It was a magnet uh, not only from, for African Americans from the South, but Arab Americans who were arriving uh, that knew that they could get a decent wage and a long-term opportunity there. Uh, let me say that political, especially electoral politics, uh, were very short on uh, activity at that period. People concentrated before then and during that t time in the development of their most basic institutions, their families, their fraternal organizations, and their churches and mosques. Uh, you're seeing at this time uh, in the early 1900s, actually just prior to 1920, the creation of the very first mosque in Highland Park. And uh, the forays into electoral politics really don't even begin, even on a limited basis, uh, until the 1930s. Uh, what does happen, however, is Arab Americans become very active in the <laughs> local activity having to do with the union movement. And I'm going to go beyond the time on this in terms of beyond the time of the, this period to kind of take us through the union movement. We started out, uh, I think, uh, involved as workers, uh, many, not only on the side of the UAW, but frankly on the side, on the other side, the company side as well. To quote my own grandmother when I asked her, uh, well, what did you think? There were the hunger marches and the strikes, and uh, she said, to tell you the truth, we didn't know what to think because we were in it and on both sides of it. And so Arab Americans became politically active around the UAW's uh, attempts to launch the union movement. And they were in uh, three areas uh, of UAW activity, the Highland Park plant, uh, the Flint plant, and the uh, Rouge plant. And the Flint plant and the Rouge plant became icons for UAW activity. Uh, a person who uh, did, uh, who was a key element there was George Idis. And if you are familiar with him, you notice that he died about a week ago. Uh, or, uh, uh, he was a key activist and later became the secretary, first secretary treasurer of the UAW. But there were many, many others. And over the years, Arab Americans became so tied to the union that they also became the ward healers for the union. In other words, when they wanted to turn out the Arab vote, they would send uh, uh, several people who are in the paper, I won't enumerate them, but like Joe Barry, and even into the 60s, like a guy like uh, uh, Muhammad Issa, who would stand at the pole, do what the union told him to do, and pass out the union slate cards, and the democratic slate cards. Uh, and so this was also a transference into the Democratic Party uh, as well. Now, later Arab Americans run into some problems with the UAW, their purchase of Israeli bonds in the 1970s. But there's also a democratic lesson here. They organized the Arab Workers Caucus, which I chaired at the time, uh, and uh, took on the UAW's holding of Israeli bonds and elected Arab Americans across the country, uh, including in California, to the UAW convention to raise the issue. Now, they were small in number, but today the UAW does no, no longer has Israeli bonds. Uh, they did not drop them at that time, but the message got sent. 
uh, and I think that that was an important period. Uh, but also, uh, as the UAW moved on, uh, for instance, in the last period, Stephen Jokic, who's also passed, became an Arab American, became the head of the union. It was interesting because at the same time, the head of the Ford Motor Company was an Arab American. And in fact, they used to come to access and then go off in a corner and negotiate. Uh, so uh, this was an important period, too, for Arab Americans because they worked Arab Americans into the democratic slate. Literally, they produced the number of people we would send to national, office, uh, national uh, uh, conventions and uh, would assure us a, a person on each Democratic slate to run off, uh, run off each, uh, each election. And they still do that, by the way. So the UAW and the unions, many other unions, were pivotal to Arab American progress. Also, I want to say that there was a period in which a lot of Arab Americans basically began to run for office on their own. They really were not functions of the community. and nominally functions of community interest. And uh, I have a list of them, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but I'll just mention a couple of those. And those include, uh, I want to get the first one for you because he was a surprise to me. Uh, wow. OK. Uh, Bill Cody, who ran in the 1930s, was the first I could identify. Uh, who ran, but in the 40s and 50s, there was a gradual increase. Uh, you had uh, George Bushara Sr., who, uh, who ran for a judge, uh, and his, later his son was uh, represent, uh, elected to the Wayne State Board. But this was the first person I could identify that built a base among Arab Americans to run. Now, he never won but, uh, he was, as a judge, but his, his son did, and he opened up an interest in the Arab American community, especially among entrepreneurs to support him. The Hamity brothers, for instance, in Lansing were big supporters of his. Uh, and there were many others, mainly attorneys who were uh, put into office by politicians like John Corey, for instance, for their political work. And Joseph Rashid Sr., who was appointed chief trial lawyer uh, in the prosecutor's office in the 1950s, and then, uh, then later became a circuit court judge. And actually, his son holds his seat today. Walter Shammy, who never won, but ran uh, incessantly for mayor of Detroit. And, uh, and also, I want to point out Anthony uh, Mansour, who was a judge in uh, Flint and an activist in the Republican Party as well, uh, who even uh, who was one of the clear examples of a person who took the community and the community's ideas and interests with him. And though he was a Republican, uh, was active on Palestinian issues and took them everywhere he went. Um, also, uh, as we move on to the 60s and 70s, uh, there were several other people who are worth mentioning. Michael Berry uh, in, uh, in the county of Wayne, who helped uh, elect uh, G. Manon Williams, then, uh, then helped elect uh, John Dingell, who is still in Congress today, uh, and was recently, uh, recently uh, acknowledged by the Arab American Institute. And then, and he also was active in the recall of Orville Hubbard uh, around race issues. He believed not only uh, did he discriminate against African Americans, but also Arab Americans. He became so powerful that he basically uh, headed the Road Commission, which was the single most powerful position in the county. And even the airport, the international airport in Detroit, is named after him today. Um, it's not really until the 60s, though, that we stop seeing individuals run as individuals. And then instead, people run as, uh, as uh, functions of their community and their community commitment and uh, of their issues. Uh, there's two things that happen uh, during this period. Uh, one of them is in the 50s and 60s, you see pan-Arabism cross the ocean. Uh, not only come to America, but Detroit specifically. And some key leaders who will la later really lead Arab Americans uh, uh, 
Abdeen uh, Jabara, uh, Jim Zogby, uh, Senator Aberesk grow out of this period, formative period and into the 60s, uh, and many others at the local level. Uh, Michigan plays a pivotal role in all of this, uh, in part because some of these people are in Michigan, and also it's a base of support for that work. Uh, I want to point to a woman who runs during this period because it's an interesting period also. It's a period after 1967 in which Arab Americans get a shock to the system, and in particular in Michigan. And the result of that uh, is not just that there's discrimination, but there's institution building. We talked about uh, you know, the university graduates coming in and becoming an Arab American think tank, but you see hundreds of Arab American organizations. There are student organizations on every campus. Uh, there are a, a plethora of them, and I don't have time to, to list them. But that institutional platform becomes important because it's a launch, launching platform for the ADC, uh, Palestine Human Rights, uh, and AAA, AAI, not just in Michigan, but it, it's part of that launching pad that's really very important. And. Uh, there's also now an interest in other issues other than Arab American issues, environmental issues, urban renewal issues. And growing out of there, I point to an example, a woman named Helen Atwell, who in Dearborn runs first Arab woman, first Arab American to run for city council. And she runs completely on, uh, on an urban renewal platform. Uh, and she doesn't win, but she, treads the way for other Arab Americans. Later on, you have Alan Amon, who is elected to the school board, uh, Suzanne Serini, who runs as a Democrat, but then later becomes a Republican, and a key Republican uh, as she hooks up with Spencer Abraham. Uh, all of those people came out of that period of ferment. Uh, some more than others reflect the issues of Arab Americans. Uh, what, what happens, I think, then is that um, you see a period in which there is other kinds of institution building. Our own organization, Access, comes into existence, the first of the human service organizations. Uh, there are uh, about 17 to 20 of them now across the country. And we'll talk about that in a second. But, uh, and it's an activist organization uh, that at first poo-poos uh, electoral politics, but later finds, along with their counterpart, the Arab Chaldean Council, that they have to lobby to bring money in. And so that pulls them into electoral politics, as well as does their activism. Um, let me say that at this point, I'm going to jump way ahead because the time is short, and say to you that at this point, I believe that the view that electoral play politics are not part of the Arab American arsenal uh, no longer whole sway. And that now there are literally hundreds of Arab Americans that run for office in Michigan, many of them who are elected, uh, although uh, there is much to be done. I believe that this will happen across the country. It is a question of whether they will reflect the ideals and the needs of their communities versus whether they will run and whether this will happen. Because they got three minutes, I want to jump ahead of all of that and say a few things. One is I think the weakness in terms of electoral politics is that we jump too fast ahead organizationally. We have maybe 300 churches, mosques, uh, fraternal organizations in their own silos in this country. Uh, and some of them are big silos, and some of them are small silos, but they still are silos. Then we have a couple national organizations that are doing good work, even though they're underfunded. Uh, dis discrimination work, electoral work. But what we lack is the 60 community centers across the country that the Jewish community used as a platform to build its activity. And we need to pay time and attention to creating those, because those will be the platform in which 
uh, we move ourselves ahead, along with some other kinds of institutions that tell our story to the American people. Because it's not simply by being elected that you change politics and you change a country. Uh, it's more sophisticated than that. The good news is that it's possible to do. We have the money to do it, we have the intelligence to do it, and we have the ability to do it. Uh, the bad news is uh, that uh, we have to work past our fractions and our differences opinion and find those middle grounds that we can make a difference. Thank you very much. Hello. <laughs> well, um, my talk on Arab Americans and civil liberties post 9-11, I think will fall somewhere in between uh, Dean's negative story and Isha's fairly positive story, uh, a little bit of both. Now, as we all know, after 9-11, the civil liberties of all Americans uh, have been jeopardized. But those of Arab Americans are especially vulnerable. As we've already heard, historically, Arab Americans have been a minority and in sometimes an embattled minority in this country. And their position has always been, as Michael pointed out, especially vulnerable at times of crisis in the Middle East. And as we all know in this room, you know, crisis is a matter of life in the Middle East. I mean, it's a daily event. Uh, but certainly after every major war, particularly, for example, after the 67 Arab-Israeli War, uh, there was a flood of anti-Arab racism from both the media and the American public throughout the United States. Now, these threats were primarily in the form of Arab bashing, ethnic intimidation, racial stereotyping, sometimes physical attacks or arson. But after 9-11, you not only had Arab Americans caught in a rising tide of anti-Arabism and anti-Islamic prejudice, but at the same time, you had systemic changes to laws and to law enforcement that imperiled the civil liberties of the community. Now, in a poll of Arab Muslims taken by Zogby International right after the 9-11 attacks, 50% of those surveyed reported the community had experienced an increase in discrimination, with verbal abuse cited as the most frequent problem. FBI figures during the same period of time reported that anti-Islamic crimes jumped from 28 in the year 2000 to 481 in 2001. And most of those obviously were in the last four months of the year. That's a 1,600% increase. Hate crimes based on ethnicity during the same period of time increased from over 900 to over 2,000. But now keep in mind, to put this in proportion, that was still fewer than the crimes reported against Arab, uh, African Americans, Jews, or homosexuals during that same period of time. But as the FBI also said, the hate crimes against Muslims was undoubtedly much higher than that reported, but that simply many Muslims were so afraid they didn't report the crimes. And now at the same time you had these kinds of increases, you had the U.S. Patriot Act and the so-called Domestic Security Enhancement Act of the year 2003. This all allowed for increased government surveillance, uh, increased uh, tracking of immigrants, encouraging neighbors to spy on neighbors, businesses to report terrorism uh, tips. And right after 9-11, as we all know, uh, a number of Arabs, Muslims, Arab Americans were taken into custody. The government has not uh, yet released how many or the names of these individuals, so the estimates are around 1,200 to 1,300, many held then without access to counsel or to their families. This then clearly indicates a pattern of targeting Arabs, Muslims, and Arab Americans.
And then in the summer of 2002, the Justice Department announced it was going to begin enforcing a 50-year-old law requiring non-citizens, including green card holders, to report a change of address within 10 days of moving to the INS. This also then frequently involved personal interviews. These regulations were extended to males over 16 years of age from dozens of Middle East um, nations, including those with dual nationality. <coughs> but unlike the 67 crisis, after 9-11, Arab American communities took proactive attempts in terms of dealing with these kinds of attacks. In 2006, CARE joined with the ACLU in attempts to end wiretapping surveillance. Now, it's not clear how many Arab Americans are actually uh, under surveillance or have been historically under surveillance, but in 2006, the FBI documents did indicate that in at least one instance, that of the well-known uh, Arab American intellectual, the late Edward Said, uh, he had been under surveillance since the 1970s, uh, decades before 9-11, uh, and Abdeen can speak to uh, similar situations in the 70s. University police forces were recruited to track individual students and Arab American organizations. The government began to monitor Iraqi Americans. All of this then brings up the issue of infringements on the freedom of expression and the right of association. It also opens the door for increased racial profiling by corporations and businesses, and especially by airlines. In 2004, the Discrimination Research Center reported that there was absolutely a notable hiring disparity based on ethnicity. What they did was actually to take one vita, and they then attached different names of uh, ethnic origin, uh, Hispanic names, uh, Asian names, uh, uh, Arab American names, and then they sent out that Vita with the different names to numbers of different businesses and corporations. And the results were that those with Arab names, or interestingly South Asian sounding names, received the lowest positive responses to the job application. Keep in mind it's the same application, just a different name. So racial profiling with the community is definitely a major problem across the country. Uh, time obviously doesn't permit for me to go through even a, a fraction of all these examples. But let me give you just a sample of the kinds of problems. After 2001, ADC reported that there was a notable increase of police stopping cars driven by people who apparently had um, the characteristics of Arab Americans. In one case, three Florida students were stopped, Af um, Arab Americans, um, by the police after the police received a tip from a civilian of suspicious looking individuals driving driving a car. Uh, this prompted some to talk about being guilty of DWA, driving while Arab. Uh, and that was just one instance. Uh, you also had a huge problem in terms of racial profiling by the airline industry. From 2001 to 2002, ADC received over 60 reports of over 100 different individuals being either denied access to uh, flights where they had the ticket, or in some cases, actually physically being removed from their seats on the airlines after they'd gone through all this of the security checks. ADC did bring lawsuits against the airlines on behalf of five of those individuals. You also had similar problems in terms of businesses. The P-TECH case is one example, a high-tech firm owned by a Lebanese American. The FBI came in, seized documents, the media got hold of it. Um, 
employees of the or, uh, PTAC were actually then um, uh, recipients of hate mail, hate telephone calls, and in some cases actually had their bank accounts closed by banks in the area. Of course, the government also brought charges uh, against a number of defendants following 9-11. However, here again, <coughs> Arab American organizations opposed the government policies that endangered their communities. So that these kind of attacks and constrictions have not taken place in a vacuum as they did in most cases after 67. So what have they done? Well, the Arab American organizations have taken legal action, as I mentioned, various uh, court cases. They've contacted politicians on national, local, state levels. They've organized national outreach educational programs for the general American public, and I think those have long-term positive impacts. They've informed Arab Americans about their legal rights, sometimes providing legal assistance. ADC issues alerts, maintains a website, publishes a newsletter, regularly updates its report on hate crimes and discrimination against Arab Americans. ADC also has screened films such as Munich and Syriana for possible anti-Arab uh, stereotypes. It had a successful campaign against racist billboards in North Carolina. At its annual summer convention, it holds a lobby day where members meet with people from Congress. ADC and a number of other organizations met with Attorney General Gonzalez to urge him to end the National Security Entry Exit Registration System, which I referred to earlier. AAI has uh, involved Arab Americans in the political process. They too have joined in lawsuits in conjunction with other civil rights organizations. NAAA, ADC, AAI contacted members of Congress, engaged in lobbying activities. The Council on American-Islamic Relations launched a major publicity advertising campaign after 9-11. They took out a series of 52 ads in the New York Times that attempted to put a human face on uh, Islam, on Muslims in this country, emphasizing in particular the diversity of the community. The Muslim Public Affairs Council convention in December 2002 voted to call on the INS to end the selective immigration registration program. Likewise, the AAI and a lot of other organizations signed a public letter to President Bush regarding their concerns over the INS policies. CARE and other Muslim organizations have also importantly begun to coordinate their efforts through the Unified American Muslim Task Force on Civil Rights and Elections. All of this demonstrates, as Ish talked about, I think, too, the importance of having well-established community organizations in place to fight prejudice and stereotyping. And certainly the community in Detroit and Access in particular are instructive of how important and how effective that can be. Because frankly, after 9-11, the Detroit, Michigan community might well have expected, since it's so large and so visible, it might have expected to receive a very high uh, impact uh, in terms of attacks, hate mail, et cetera. Now, while some individuals and organizations in the Detroit area did get uh, nasty emails, uh, uh, telephone calls, et cetera, the community worked with, and here's two important things, they worked with the media and with law enforcement officials to prevent what might have been a really nasty backlash. So that in 2004, the Detroit Arab American study conducted by the University of Michigan found that 15% of Arab Americans in the Detroit area had experienced some form of harassment based on ethnic identity. But here's the interesting thing. A far greater number, one third of those polled, had actually received positive support from the larger society. 
So that this, I think, demonstrates the payoff of the kind of long-term educational outreach programs that ACCESS and other organizations have conducted in Michigan for many years. The success of ACCESS in a building campaign right after 9-11, I think, is also instructive in this regard, that that campaign attracted major corporate as well as private uh, contributions and then led to the opening of the first ever national Arab American Museum just a year ago in 2005. And in the very first year, the museum has become a major venue for all kinds of cultural events that put, again, a human face on the experience of Arab Americans and Muslims as well. So what we've seen in the last few years is a number of cultural events where you have Arab American comedians, poets, <laughs> uh, performers, giving all kinds of performances dealing with the problems of being Arab American, with the problems of the Arab world, but through popular cultural approaches, which demonstrates clearly, first of all, that they don't have a language problem and that they don't have really the feeling that they are alien within the larger society. And that therefore they're comfortable in highlighting the problems of the community in ways that reach the larger society in a very positive way. So that open lines of communication, a relationship of trust, can help to create an appropriate atmosphere to have effective responses to protect the community both in terms of general stereotyping and racism, but also to try to deal with government issues. Lines of communication, I think, are also vitally necessary to develop with other like-minded ethnic organizations, civil rights organizations, community organizations. And in that sense, I'd like to mention, uh, in particular, the lines of communication that were established between Arab Americans and Japanese Americans prior to 9-11, that several years prior to 9-11, access in Detroit and uh, Japanese organizations had set up lines of communication, had held joint meetings, Japanese American organizations helped to advise on displays and approaches to take in the uh, Arab American Museum. And in fact, they had sponsored a joint conference dealing with the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II. Well, the result of this is that after 9-11, Japanese Americans were aware of and sympathetic to the problems of Arab Americans. So that when a congressman, uh, unnamed, a Republican from North Carolina, I will say, um, supported in positive terms on the radio the possible internment of Arab Americans, comparing it favorably to the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II. Japanese American organizations were over that like a wet blanket. Uh, they immediately publicly repudiated the congressman, called for his resignation as chair of the Subcommittee on Crime, Terrorism, and Homeland Security, and said publicly, and I'll quote here, our country must create policies to defend our national security without violating the constitutional rights of whole communities based on race, national origin, and religion. The representative's defense of the internment of Japanese Americans is ridiculous. However, after 9-11, and this is the downside to this and my conclusion, many Arab Americans to the present continue to feel vulnerable and embattled in their own country. And frankly, in the present climate of warmongering, the ongoing conflict in Iraq, the endless war on terrorism, 
the unresolved Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Frankly, the social and political climate for Arab Americans remains volatile and uncertain, and I think it's likely to remain that way for some time into the future. Thank you. Okay, we are open for questions. Yes? Um, over in the middle. Zuhair Imadi of the Syrian News Agency. I've lived in this country for 27 years. I've become a U.S. citizen, but I've watched the U.S. Arab uh, organizations. I remember still the National Arab American Organization that existed in late 70s. And just talking with uh, Professor Sam Zamrik, the Syrian-American, like you, speaks like you, was born uh, in Syria, came here when he was six years old. He is uh, the mechanical uh, professor of engineering in the Pennsylvania University. He contributed to the spaceship, crea uh, invented the uh, heat uh, pads for the spaceship. So he used to be a member of that or a great organization of the National Arab Orga uh, American Organization. Now we look at the ADC. Mr. Abdin, I would like to hear your answer, your experience along with the rest of the panel. What, why should the Arab American uh, uh, keep, should they keep trying to uh, go through certain organizations that talk about discrimination, about uh, other subjects, while other minorities in America have been actually held back from progress in their life because they, of their grievances all the time about so many things. Shouldn't the Arab American try to go back to that level of the National Arab American Organization where they, uh, they presented themselves as uh, assimilated uh, committee and a community and they were able to make mo much more progress that way? Okay. Abdi? <clears throat> <laughs> well, the way I see it is that uh, there were very various stages in the development of the Arab American community post-1967. Uh, the first stage, uh, and this um, is piggybacking on what Dr. Soleiman said, uh, Arab American intellectuals uh, kind of... Uh, feeling under enormous threat and isolation uh, uh, literally circled the wagons, to use a phrase, although I, it's not a really appropriate phrase. They circled the wagons and they said, and, and they really didn't understand how America worked domestically. Many, most of them were immigrants here and were teaching in universities, etc. But they uh, thought, well, we should have to present a different, a whole different literature, a whole different idea about what the issues are. And they did that. They held many conferences and, and issued many books, et cetera. And they had a, 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 a lot of people do not understand this. At that time, there was an official organization that was in charge of Middle Eastern studies on campuses around the United States called the Middle East Studies Association, which you've probably heard of, MESA. It was very conservative. It was uh, the, the people in MESA pretty much uh, uh, reflected a, a power, you know, a more of a, a very traditional colonial attitude. Well, with the events of the 60s in the United States and the efforts of this AAUG, they were able to make a serious change in how uh, the, the teaching on campus. So that today you see many of these programs and teacher professors coming under attack uh, because, quote, they're not balanced, uh, they're uh, uh, biased, they're not, giving, uh, they're not protecting students' rights, all of this. this. There was a concerted campaign to target these people because 
Israeli point of view did not have a lock hold on the campuses that they did in Congress. <coughs> now let's come to the issue of fighting discrimination. And indeed, when we started to complain about discrimination and stereotyping, etc., we found a ready audience. People were receptive to this. Uh, it, was, it was absolutely the correct strategy because they understood this. No, that's not American. It's not American to discriminate. And so we found a re receptive audience. But when we tried to impact on the political level, they said, uh-oh, <laughs> stay away from this. This is not your terrain. Uh, so, you know, in my paper, and I didn't get a chance to talk about all this, but in my paper, I tried to talk about some of the successes. I didn't, my, my paper was quite negative. <laughs> but, but there have been some successes. <laughs> and, and one of them was this AAG and the impact on academia. Another one was the way in which, when Jimmy Carter came into office and he began talking about human rights, that was, of course, a reaction to Watergate. Jimmy Carter wanted to overcome the uh, black uh, reputation of American politics because of Watergate. And he talked about human rights, and that became a, a central thing. Well, they set up an assistant secretary of state for human rights. They started compiling reports about countries' human rights records, et cetera. Well, we, we went and dovetailed into that. And we grabbed onto this human rights issue. I remember when Jimmy Carter held this Camp David, the first Camp David thing. We had the Palestine Human Rights Campaign, and we, what we did is we hired a, 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 a plane, a private plane, to pull a banner that said, Palestinians have human rights too, and we flew it over Camp David at the time that they were meeting there. Well, the guy got arrested when he landed, the, uh, police, uh, the, uh, the uh, airline pilot, because he says, I didn't know I was uh, flying over some area. <laughs> the point is, is what we tried to do, what we tried to do is to find avenues to uh, uh, catch on to something that was au, au courant, that was, that was uh, uh, current in American society, that people understood that they could connect to. So I think there's been a progression, all right? We went beyond the whole academic situation of the AUG, We've, the discrimination issue, while it continues. That's not the main issue. The main issue is the political exclusion of Arab Americans. They refused money. We had many cases of politicians refusing Arab Americans' contributions. Uh, Arab Americans don't have the 30, 40 uh, political action committees that they set up. We, we, we challenged uh, the violations of the Federal Campaign Financing Act and so forth, and we didn't succeed. But the reality is, is that Amer Arab Americans are not going to be part and parcel of this no, I'm not until the, those Corzain and, and Senator Menendez in New Jersey say to Mr. Merhi, look, Mr. Merhi, we're going to support you for this job of freeholder, all right, D despite the fact that we don't necessarily agree with you. That's when that's going to happen. Now, I, okay. when it's going to happen, I don't know. Let me, can't. Let me just add four quick yeah. things. I think there's uh, something said that is, you know, have a formula, follow the formula, and the third one is follow the formula. <laughs> so I'm going to suggest a formula. One, there are national organizations, and I didn't have time to quote the chapter and verse about the value of the Arab American Institute in pollinating political activity in this country among Arab Americans. Uh, so supporting the ADC, supporting the AAI financially and with people is part of the formula. We have these institutions, they're poorly supported and they need that. And we need it. Two, that that's not enough. And I talked a little bit about that. We need the on-the-ground organizations, and I don't yes. think they're PACs yet. I think you need community centers across this country who people believe in, trust, and will come to eventually to develop the PACs. So there's a two-step solution there. That doesn't mean we shouldn't develop PACs. But that work needs to be done. 
Okay, that's two. And uh, there is now a national network of Arab American communities, for Arab American communities, and I'll be glad to tell you more about them. They're in 11 states, there's 17 of them, uh, that's brand new, and we'll give you information. They need to be supported, joined, and work with at the ground level. That's two. Number three, uh, we need to develop a scientific approach to philanthropy. This country runs on money, and the political system runs on money and votes. You need money to do that. And I don't agree that this isn't a wealthy community. We have a lot of low-income people, but we can compete electorally with money, but we haven't applied the science of philanthropy in our communities and to our national institutions. It's something that's learnable and must be done if we're to progress. We can't progress in, with the approach we now have financially. And finally, we can't do it alone. There are three and a half million of us. Even in Michigan, we must have allies. Our allies can't just be about us. In Michigan today, the, anti, the immigrant movement acts as at the center of that, along with Latin organizations. Okay, why? The undocumented is not really our central question as Arab Americans, but there we can raise the other questions that need to be raised about immigration. Uh, and I use that only as one example. When we were attacked, the unions came out, the African American organizations came out in Michigan, and a plethora of others. Because we've worked with them on their issues and infused our issues as well, that alliance is more important than the Irish, certainly, and more important than the Jewish community because there were even more people in the Jewish community than us. Our numbers are too small for us to do it by ourselves. Uh, and finally, as hard as electoral work is, we cannot abandon it. Uh, and it's not our, all, the only thing in our arsenal and shouldn't be, but we must do everything we possibly can to move that forward. Okay. I'd just like to say one thing about uh, the assimilation issue. Uh, it's my belief that uh, when they come to get you, assimilation doesn't protect you. Um, organizations <laughs> protect you. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Anton Hajar. Um, I'm a union labor lawyer. Um, and um, I want to tell you uh, that I've been frustrated for years by this, our community's inability to put together <coughs> Arab American Legal Defense Fund, like La Raza or the uh, NAACP Legal Defense Fund. And um, I'm kind of astounded that these efforts have not, uh, have not succeeded, given the fact that the courts are one avenue to, uh, to assure um, um, you know, equal rights. And I want to say one more thing, that when you talk about building alliances, I can tell you from my work, both in civil liberties and in the labor movement, one of our strongest allies are progressive Jews, of which there are many, many. One thing we need to do, let's be frank about it, is to fight anti-Semitism in our own community. Absolutely. And we have alliances there. We have ability to... Uh, to, uh, you know, they, they refer to Temple Sinai up here as the ACLU at prayer. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, but I'd like to know from the panel, why do you think it is that you've made your organizations and you've made your alliances and we still don't have a, uh, a legal defense fund? Very briefly. <laughs> <laughs> Money. <laughs> And I've already spoken to it. If you have a good cause, it's not enough. Uh, you have to have a way of building over a period of time the income that, that you need, and, it, and it's doable. Okay, over here. Well, I'm Martin Frost. I was a congressman from Texas for 26 years, and I was the only Jewish congressman from Texas. Right after 9-11, I spoke out repeatedly, publicly, 
against hate crimes, against Arab Americans in, in my area, and against people from other parts of the, uh, of the world who looked like they were from that area. Uh, my question is a long-term question. Assuming that it's possible that there's going to be a, a successful two-state solution between the Israelis and the Palestinians, what are the long-term prospects of the American, of the, uh, of the Arab community in this country and the Jewish community working together? And a more short-term question, there are a lot of people in the Jewish community here, progressive members of the Jewish community, who are actively advocating for a successful two-state solution in ways that aren't always supported by some other people in the Jewish community. And so what are the possibilities for coalition, short-term and long-term? Mm -hmm. I, I think on the, on the long-term, I think is very good. In the, if, that, if that problem can be resolved, it will reduce terrorism by 70%, and it will make for the possibility of real liberal, progressive coalition building here all that much greater. No, I mean, I agree that, uh, that uh, we, uh, uh, we should, should continue to do the work, and uh, especially with the progressive Jewish community on these questions. It's in all of our interest. And also, clearly, we need to stand up publicly against terrorism. There is only one thing. I, I know I'm the chair and shouldn't speak, but <laughs> it depends what kind of Palestinian state is created. If it's the one in all merit's mind, I don't expect that it will resolve anything. It has to be one based on equity and justice. Uh, yes, go ahead. Okay. Uh, Omar Kader, I'm a past executive director of ADC. I haven't heard any comments about the struggles within the Arab American community between those who want to assimilate like the Irish and the Italians and not be seen and, and are fundamentally racist towards being aligned with the black community. You see that all across the board. And those of the others that want the distinct identity, get involved in the civil rights organizations and struggles, and most of the money is in that first group. They're third, fourth generation Arab Americans, fairly wealthy established. And they're not going to join the Arab American movement. I could say something about that. Sure. It seems to me that um, you're certainly right. I, uh, but I think there's a generational difference that I, I'm seeing, is that the older generation um, often have that stance. But interestingly, their children or grandchildren uh, are much more open and, and curious about their uh, Arab ethnicity, uh, much more open about the differences, um, particularly in terms of racial differences and religious differences, and they don't carry, uh, if you will, the baggage uh, that the older generation has. And I think that's a hopeful sign in terms of, of the community coalescing uh, and uh, dealing with this issue of assimilation, that you can be assimilated and yet you can have pride and um, political activism around given issues that are of interest. Over here. You had a question? Yeah, I, actually, I, well. I saw your hand. <laughs> yes. Uh, no, I was agreeing with the, the statement made by the gentleman next to you, Smile. Uh, the <laughs> main, <name> issue, <laughs> the <laughs> main issue that I really find worrying is uh, fundraising. Fundraising is in the Arab community is not well done. Mm -hmm. And I have been a founder of the National Association of Arab Americans. I am a founder of the Jerusalem Fund in Washington. Where we succeeded at the Jerusalem Fund is we established a, uh, a uh, endowment. This is what most Arab American organizations do not understand, that without an endowment, they will never succeed. That's why AAA went down, among other things, as Abdin would probably know about them. Uh, but I'm very interested in how access is successful financially. Uh, just, or it seems to me successful. Just let me say that it's been a short road, so we have a lot to learn. But first, we. Uh, ten years ago, the most we'd ever raised for a project, actually eight years ago, was about $100,000. Uh, 
uh, five years ago, the most we'd ever raised was $3 million. Uh, and it was a learning curve. And uh, this museum and actually some other facilities is a $21 million campaign. We're just short of finishing that. The museum part is already done, and the first uh, health center is already done. It's a science. I don't know how else to explain it. There is, you know, there's a way of asking, identifying people to, to ask, a way of, you know, uh, getting out there, and if you don't apply the science, you, uh, you can't make progress. And two, it's an educational process. The same people that used to give us $100 now give us $10,000. The same people. And these are middle class people at Access, the staff of Access, who came to believe in what we were doing, and there's uh, almost 200 of them now, okay, gave, uh, gave almost 100, I'm sorry, $208,000. Our staff gave that. These are people who make in the range of twenty-five to forty thousand dollars a year, okay? Because they figured out how they could give. They could give it over a period of time. So we've got to get out there and do this. And one of the good things is there's a lady at Access named Maha Frage now, who's our CFO, who's in fact uh, working with the Aspen Institute and some other folks to go around the country. And ask people, why do you give? How do you give? Where will you give? Uh, so that we can begin to cross the country and talk to people about how to raise money this way. Okay, over there, please. Uh, Mohammed Wasfi, I am IMF retiree, and uh, for Adnan and Ismail, uh, and uh, Dr. Salaman is here. Uh, we have been in this country for 100 years. Why we, until now, cannot put our act together? What are the reasons? And for uh, uh, Terry or Jenna, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I cannot see your name because of... Uh, <clears throat> my youngest child is senior and he's graduating from college. It was recommended for him to put in his application for jobs the name Muhammad, which is my first name, not last. My last is can be Christian. And they said that companies, especially big ones, they like to see diversity. And Arabic language is in demand. I see that, you know, not 100% compatible with what you said. Do you have any comment? Well, I think Thank it you. may. It may depend on what kind of job you're hunting for. Um, that if you're going out to get a job as a teller in a bank, you don't want to have the name Muhammad. Um, if you're going out to get a job with a corporation that's interested in getting business uh, in the Arab world, um, then uh, the name Muhammad might well be useful. So I think it, it really is uh, a dependent on, on the kind of job, to some degree the location uh, of where you happen to be, that certain areas in the country it would be, it, in my impression is, harder to find a job with a given kind of ethnic names, not just Arab uh, names, uh, than f in Washington, D.C. Uh, let me just say a comment on that. Number one, I think uh, I think has been uneven the progress. Uh, certainly, access in the museum is a tremendous success. So that is part of getting the act together. What access has done is really quite remarkable. And those of you who have not been to Detroit and did the tour of access in the museum should do so. But the reality of the situation is, is that 9-11 put us back a long, long way. And if you wanted to point to one fact that has uh, changed much of the progress that was being made, and there was a lot of progress, ADC did an enormous amount in that regard. But 9-11 put us back. There's no question about it. And it's going to take a long time for that to uh, dissipate. Over there. Yeah, I, I guess your hand is that. Yes. Did you have a question? 
No. And, uh, no. Okay. Go ahead. My name is Marwan Bergian. I can tell you that uh, I did some studies of voter turnout for urban Muslim Americans in Fairfax County, where we have over 21,000 registered voters. In 2000, in the presidential election, 48.8% of urban Muslim Americans turned out to vote. They ranked fifth among the largest six groups in that county. In 2004, 67.6% turned out in that uh, election. I think that's in response to Patriot Act, Iraq War, and so people are participating more. In fact, even in the Jim Moran primary, where Arab Americans and other ethnics participate at less than 1%, Arab Americans and Muslim Americans increased their participation to 17%, exceeding white Anglos. So there is a move, I think, for people to participate. I think the issue is to invest in, in local activism, in explaining to them why they have to vote and how they can you know, do it. First, secondly, I think we do need an anti-defamation league on the Arab side, because if you are vocal then, and you lose your job, uh, unless you are rich, you cannot sue or you cannot find other employment as easily. Third, I think we came short from 1981 onwards in terms of studies of news reports bias against Arabs and Arab Americans. I think the pro-Israeli community did an excellent job after the invasion of Lebanon in terms of having at least eight or nine content analysis of the news media and kowtowed the media to pre-1982 invasion. But the Arab American community has not risen to that level. I hope that we can find some solutions to these things. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I find Randa K. Alley from George Mason University. Um, I find an interesting contradiction in terms of the development of Arab American institutions in that the 1967 war prompted the creation, I believe, of an Arab American identity and AUG. Um, and yet the politics of the Middle East keeps coming into Arab American institutions um, and causing splinters within them. Um, and sometimes quite major splinters. And I think that that affects, of course, it affects the, the political effectiveness of these organizations. And so while some of them have made great achievements, um, it's also the success is being held back <coughs> by, um, you know, not appreciating the diversity and the differences between Arab Americans. And I'd like you to address that. Anybody want to do? I'll, I'll take a shot at it. I mean, uh, I'll use the founding of the Arab American Museum as an example. I mean, part of it, part of that work was consciously understanding that there are some things that Arab Americans have in common, but then going across the country and talking to just about everyone who had an opinion and trying to fashion a story that included them. So I think there is the big tent, but the other thing I'd say is, Every organization doesn't need to exist. I mean, there will be organizations where they cannot find enough unity, enough agreement on issues and activity to, to move on. And uh, it's, there's, a, there's a natural, or, or, the, or the funding or whatever, there's a natural selection process of relevance. Uh, so I don't know if that makes sense or not, but uh, you know, I think that if you look in a general sense, there is some big tent progress, uh, and I think that that's a good thing, but it's a leavening activity that's going on. And finally, just this is related to this and the last question, because they really come together. We haven't been at, at it that long. I mean, somebody said we've been around 100 years, but have we been involved outside of you know, doing our families and our businesses and our fraternal organizations for about 40 years? And actually in electoral politics for about 20 years. So, you know, there's a lot to be learned and a lot of change that we're going to have to go through. And I'm not so upset with the progress. I mean, I'm upset with the final outcome. I don't want to be dealt with as a result of a lot of things in the Patriot Act and other. But, but are we making progress? I think we are making some. 
I, mean, um, I think, yeah, if I, can, I, I think there really are two trends in terms of Arab American organizations, that there's the trend that deals with domestic issues. Um, the, the issues of, of uh, legal rights, uh, of stereotyping, of racial profiling um, that ADC and others have dealt with, and those that deal with issues of the community, uh, like access. And I think there has been very notable success on those levels. But when you get into the realm of foreign policy, uh, and issues uh, that relate then back to this country and, and the foreign policy of the United States, uh, the organizations have had minimal or no impact on changing U.S. foreign policy. Um, we have several panels in the afternoon. More to come. Go have some lunch and come back on time. Thank you. Good to be here with you. Yeah. Yeah.